All right, I am back once again, and once again I have a Nikon rangefinder, but as you can probably tell by looking at it, this one is pretty different from the other ones I've looked at in the past. Most of the ones I've gone over have been uh, Nikon rangefinders from more or less the 1950s. This is a Nikonis V, or 5 in Roman numerals, uh, and this is the second to last Nikonis camera. And the Nikonises were made by Nikon, but they were specifically designed for underwater use by predominantly divers, but I think um, just people who were into water sports and stuff as well. And this is a pretty interesting camera because it is technically a rangefinder. You can see it has sort of a rangefinder window up here, uh, and it has the lenses on the front, kind of the slimmer body profile, but it's not technically a true rangefinder because it doesn't have a rangefinder mechanism. It's a zone focusing camera. So you have a viewfinder here. And it's uh, probably got about 28 millimeters worth of view, and it has 35 millimeter frame lines that correspond with this lens. It does have a bit of a parallax correction mark for close focusing, but there's no focusing mechanism to actually help you focus the camera. Uh, what you have is a, a scale up here, and you have these strange knobs on the side to turn it, which at first looked very awkward. I think it, it has kind of a neat look. It looks almost like a mouthpiece an old scuba diver would have used. Uh, and I actually have used this, wa this camera in the water a couple of times, and when you're in the water, these, these knobs are actually pretty easy to use. It's very easy to grab them and to turn them, and the fact that you have two different colors um, kind of gives you an interesting idea because the, the top silver one, or the, the silver one on the right, controls this top silver uh, mechanism here, which is the actual focusing distance, and the black one controls this bottom meter, which is your aperture. And it has a really nice scale right there where you move the aperture and it automatically shows you roughly what your field of focus is, which is very important again because this is a zone focusing camera. So you'll have to rely pretty heavily on shooting pretty wide open and then just guessing and hoping your focus is pretty close. Now that doesn't sound too bad, but it gets kind of confusing because apparently this is what's called a water contact lens. And what that means is essentially when you're underwater, uh, if you look at something like a fish underwater, you'll notice it looks kind of uh, bigger than it actually is. There's sort of a magnification, and uh, it actually will be off. Uh, from the, the angle will be off from how you see it. I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know if I can really explain this. But because of that, the focus is offset, and it's thrown off by about 30%, and I, I think it is, you, it is, uh, is it 30% closer or further? I don't know. You can look it up if you really want. I, I can't remember right now, but the focus is actually not properly calibrated for above water use. It is properly calibrated for underwater use. So if you want to use it above water, which is I imagine how a fair number of people are going to use it at least some of the time, you kind of have to keep that in mind and remember that the focus on this camera is not going to be super accurate. So you'll essentially never be able to shoot at f2.5. You'll pretty much always be shooting at f8 or wider which I imagine wouldn't be a big problem because I think most people are going to probably use this camera when they go out to the beach or the lake or something. They're probably not going to actually be diving into like caves and stuff and trying to do that kind of photography. And if you do, there are there is a big flash mechanism you can attach to this camera, and uh, I assume that would be useful. I know a lot of times I've seen them sold with that flash mechanism, uh, but I, I don't know exactly how easy it is to use and operate and even what kind of batteries it uses. I assume it's got to have independent internal batteries. Uh, so I was going to do a little review on this camera, but it's a little tough because I, I've had this camera for years. This is actually one of the longest standing cameras in my collection. Uh, I've, I've really considered selling it, and I tried to sell it not too long ago, but the guy who wanted to buy it was overseas, and the shipping and handling was going to be absurd, and I wasn't really going to be able to make any money off of it, so I ended up keeping it. Also thought it would be kind of nice to do a little video about it before I got rid of it. Uh, but it's it's kind of an interesting camera. It has um, an automatic shutter. You can see the auto feature right there, and it has the M90, which is a mechan uh, mechanical backup at 1 90th of a second. I never understood why Nikon went with 1 90th of a second on a lot of their cameras. They did that kind of later on, and I, I assume it was a standardized shutter design because I think the, uh, the FA or the FG, maybe both of them, had that same mechanism, and I want to say there might have been a couple of other later cameras some of the N-series cameras or something had that same feature, and I find it a bit odd, but it, you know, it's better than nothing. Um, since it is an automatic shutter camera, you do have the convenience of the automatic shutter, but you also have the double-edged sword of when the batteries die, you lose the meter and you lose most of your shutter speeds. You can still use the M90, but again, I find that a bit weird because normally when you see um, f-stop scales calculated, they're calculated from 125th of a second. And I've seen a lot of cameras actually have the 125th of a second mechanical shutter speed. I know that is true for a few of them. I can't think off the top of my head right now. I know the Pentex ME Super has it. And I even want to say some of the other Nikons. I want to say the, the F, 
maybe the original FE. I know the FE2 has a 250th of a second, I believe. But uh, it is just kind of strange that they're so inconsistent with that. You'd think there'd be more of an industry standard or at least a company-wide standard. But Nikon definitely did not do that. Uh, the camera's actually pretty heavy. Uh, I don't know exactly how heavy, but I'd say it weighs a solid pound, probably more than that. So it's, it's heavier than most of your standard uh, Nikon rangefinders and even a lot of your later SLRs. And it is kind of a bit thick. It's, it's a bit thicker than any of the rangefinders. And uh, when you add the lens to it, and when you consider the fact that it has this grip that kind of sticks out, it's pretty similar in size to most of the SLRs. I would say the body's probably about the same size as the Nikon F. That's almost exactly the same. I don't have one to compare it to right now, uh, but that's almost exactly what it is. The lens is pretty short. Um, there are different lenses for this. I don't know the whole lens lineup. I know there's a pretty wide angle one, like a, I want to say a 14 millimeter that's got the big bulbous front cover. And there are some longer ones. I, again, I don't know exactly how long. Uh, and I know most of them have some sort of really big external viewfinder that goes up here to kind of help aim them. Because essentially all you're doing is aiming. You've got to try and focus and, again, estimate your focus and keep all those factors in mind, like the, um, the scaling being off and everything. Which does make it kind of a frustrating camera to use. But despite that, I, um, I took it out and I got some pretty good shots with it recently. And I'll have those at the end of the film. I actually remember shooting a roll of color film on this camera years ago when I first got it. And I was able to actually dig out the roll of color film. And it had the, the negatives and it had some prints. Didn't even have a CD with it. And um, I was not very impressed by it. I used it above ground. I didn't realize, um, I don't think I realized that the, the focusing was off. Which I'm not sure mattered because I think I mishandled the film. And there were some really bad shots that had been partly... Uh, overexposed when I popped open the back. Uh, this is kind of an interesting camera and I, I think it's one of those cameras that a lot of people buy thinking they're going to use it and never really use it. And I think it's also a camera that some people buy to just set on their shelf. It's just a piece of a big collection. Uh, and I can kind of understand why. It has a very unique look in the camera world. Uh, a lot of them have this orange rubber grip. Some of the Nikonis 5s have green grip and there are some that have a black grip but I think those are actually 4s not 5s. And there was a camera that came after this too called the Nikonis RS that looks a little bit more like a standard SLR but with kind of a weird 90s color scheme. And those were auto-focusing, which would be really interesting, but apparently those are quite rare and pretty expensive. And I don't think they made a whole lot of lenses for them. I think there were only maybe three lenses for the RSs. So um, the Nikonis 4s and 5s seem to be pretty common and pretty reliable. There are older 1s, 2s, and 3s, but those get pretty old. They all have a very similar design. And I think most of those were made back in like the uh, 60s and 70s, I want to say. And they, they, again, they all look very similar. They can use the same lenses, but they're, they're pretty rudimentary. A lot of them have issues where they have sort of a plastic stuff on them that's kind of cracked and is coming off over the years. Uh, the 4s and 5s are very similar to one another and seem to have held up a lot better. But then again, they are newer by 10 to 20 years. Um, it's kind of an interesting camera. I, I don't use it a lot, like I said, because it is kind of inconvenient to use, but like the, the build quality is very impressive. It's, um, it's a very heavy duty camera. And I imagine if you, you dropped it or hit it on something, it wouldn't really do any damage. Um, now that said, I wouldn't go around just smacking it on stuff just because, but um, it does seem to be a pretty hardy, heavy duty camera. I actually, there was a guy online trying to buy one of these not too long ago who specifically wanted to buy it because he was going out in some of the, the protests and riots they were having somewhere in Europe, I want to say France, and he wanted a good heavy-duty camera that could withstand all that, uh, which is an interesting idea. I don't know if this is the camera for that because of its, um, its weird focusing mechanisms and whatnot, but it is kind of interesting because I, I think he might have been onto something. This is a very heavy-duty camera that can withstand a lot, uh, not just underwater use, but um, I, I imagine it could take quite a beating. And uh, because it doesn't have a rangefinder or anything up here, that's, that's just another thing that won't break. As inconvenient as it might seem, it is something that will give it a little bit more durability. I don't know how well the electronic shutters hold up. This one seems to work fine, and I, I generally don't hear about Nikon electronic shutter cameras having big issues and failing, but I know with certain companies and certain models, uh, they are notorious for just kind of dying after a while. But I think a lot of that is kind of a matter of opinion and also a matter of how much risk you're willing to take on buying the cameras but usually Nikon electronic shutter cameras seem to hold up very well so I wouldn't worry too much about it dying suddenly but uh, you do you do need to worry about the batteries dying so I would always carry a spare pair of batteries it uses two LR44s like most other cameras from this time period um, there's not a whole lot else to say about this camera 
Uh, one thing to note on the lens is that supposedly, and I'm not sure this is true, I can't really confirm it, people claim the, the elements are clones of the 35mm f2.5 rangefinder lens and S-mount. I don't know if that's true. I think it's an easy assumption to make because they're both 35 f2.5s. Uh, it could be true. I mean, if you look at it, the glass seems to be a little bit bigger on this one. And it obviously has that weird water contact lens where the focusing is kind of thrown and these very different knobs. So obviously they've redesigned it to some extent. But I, I, I guess it is possible it is the same elements inside. I don't know for sure. I've heard people say that, um, I don't remember the exact range, but when it came to the old Nikon rangefinder lenses, apparently pretty much all the 35s and 28s and I believe even the 25F4 supposedly all had the same elements in them and they just kind of changed the scaling or placement of them and it made, uh, made all those different lenses, which is an interesting idea, but I'm not 100% sure that's true if you look at the different lens characteristics and just the way some of the lenses are designed. I'm not certain that's true, but I think there was a little bit of truth that Nikon did get a lot of variety of use out of a, a pretty basic set of lens elements. So it is possible it is the same lens element design. Uh, I don't think it's the exact same elements. I, I imagine they did probably rescale them some or do something to make them a little different. But again, I don't know. It's hard to find information on that stuff and it's all kind of conjecture, it seems. But that is something interesting to note that it is going to have uh, pretty similar results, theoretically, to uh, the more classic Nikon rangefinders. Um, I don't really have a whole lot more to say. I will note that I, I got this camera. It came with this little uh, case right here. Uh, I don't know what you call this. It's just sort of a carrying case. And it even had something interesting. This little packet right here. And there are some rubber gaskets in this sort of grease, which is interesting in branded Nikonis. And this is something that apparently would have come with a lot of the cameras. And it, you, um, you use these as like replacement gaskets. There is one around the lens, uh, one around the back seal right here, if I remember correctly. And then you have... I think two, one for the battery case and one here, which is a little flash plug, I'm not really showing. But yeah, there's the uh, the battery case there and the little flash connector. I believe there are gaskets for all those. So as you can see, there's large, medium, small, and very small gaskets which can go in there. And you kind of oil them up and uh, have to replace them from time to time. The gaskets on this one seem to hold up incredibly well. I think they've been replaced not long before I got it. And I think it had just been stored very well. Uh, and I've never really used it. I might need to go and oil them because I've, I've had this camera sitting around for almost 10 years. Uh, strange that I've had it around for so long and rarely used it, but I do have a spare set of gaskets, so that's something interesting I can uh, potentially expand its lifespan with. Nothing too important, but something you might want to consider if you do buy these, you might need to replace the gaskets, so just another little thing to keep in mind if, you're, if, if you see a bargain one on eBay, it's probably, in reality, not going to be that cheap to buy and bring it home and use it because apparently it is pretty common they need the gaskets replaced. I think there are people that sell spare gaskets on like eBay, but I don't know how common that is and I don't know if they're the exact right size because I imagine they're probably modern reproductions and not official Nikon equipment from that period. Uh, again, I'm just kind of guessing. I don't know how often they need to be replaced. I know it does need to happen, but I don't think it needs to happen all that often. Well, from what I've seen, they hold up pretty heartily for a decade or more. And I think if you oil them before you put them on, they hold up for a long time. Uh, but it is something kind of interesting to keep in mind. Uh, I don't know if there's a whole lot more I can say about this. Like I said, I, I haven't really used it a whole lot, and I almost hate to do a review on it because I haven't used it much. Uh, but it's one of those cameras that I think I might be selling in the future, so I don't know if I'm going to use it a whole lot more and get a lot more sample images. Um, it is kind of an odd camera because it's, it's one of those things, like I said, I think a lot of people buy it and like set it on the shelf is sort of a, a little curiosity, a novelty factor, just a, a unique camera because it does have a pretty unique look. I don't think too many people actually use them and I, I say that with no real information to back me up. I'm sure there's probably a handful of people that use them a whole lot, but I, I imagine they are in a pretty small minority. But um, it's kind of a tough call. If you, if you want to do underwater work, this is realistically one of the only high-end cameras that you have out there that you can find that's readily available. Because yeah, you have something like the Nikonis RS that is a slightly better camera, but they're incredibly rare. Uh, I believe they're very expensive. I don't know if you'd even really be able to find one because their production life was very limited. I don't know how many units were made, but again, I think they're quite rare. Um, 
you have other like the cheap little disposable underwater cameras, but those always kind of look like garbage and they don't they don't hold up very well. They're very cheap cameras and you can't dive very deep with them uh, before the the seals break and they flood out. These you can go pretty deep. I don't know the exact depth, but they are used by like legitimate divers who go a couple of hundred feet underwater. Um, so I don't. Is it worth it to buy one? It, it's hard to say. If you want to do underwater photography, it's one of the only names in the game. If you want to buy it as a curiosity, sure, I guess so. I, I'm not a whole. I'm not a huge fan of just having stuff to accumulate and set on a shelf. But I know a lot of people like doing that. Um, if you want to buy it for a camera to use predominantly above water, like uh, for some sort of heavy duty, durable use, I don't know if this is the best camera. It is an option to keep in mind, but given the weird focusing and the fact that it's a zone focusing camera, I, I think it's going to cause more headaches than it's really worth. Because uh, you're, you're pretty much always going to have to shoot it like close down a whole lot. Like when I shot this camera, I think the fastest I ever shot it was around f8 maybe f5.6 even then i was very dubious i would get anything i tried to consistently shoot more around 11 and f16 i don't think i ever went quite all the way close down to f22 but i might have done at least one shot like that and i got pretty good results shooting a uh, close down like that and it wasn't too much of a hindrance i pretty much always shot it on automatic shutter just for convenience and uh like i said i got one roll i'll let you guys judge on the results um so yeah, I'll show you some of those and let you decide on this camera whether it's worth it or not. And it's kind of an interesting curiosity that I think a lot of people don't know a whole lot about. So I um, thought I'd dispense a little bit of the information I know. I know I am kind of lacking on information, but uh, it's better than nothing. And you get to see a pretty cool camera. So with that said, I'll just stop my ramblings and I'll play the slideshow and uh, give you a sample of some of the images that I shot on this camera.